Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the beauty of your word and for your spirit helping us to understand it in Jesus' name. Amen. I would like us to see how typology works in the Bible. What is typology? Typology has two components. There's a type, and there is an antitype or anti type. What is one and what is the other? A type is something that happens here, and uh, you look at it, and you have the impression, okay, there must be something much bigger to which this points. And when you look all the way down the road, you will see indeed that here there is another reality that resembles this reality, but it is much bigger, much greater than this reality. Okay? So a type points to an anti-type or anti-type. The type happens first as a historical reality, but then there's a fulfillment sometime later in history, a fulfillment that is much bigger, much greater than the type. And that typology reality is all over in the Bible. For instance, Joseph, you know about Joseph, in the Bible, was sold by his brothers and taken into captivity. Okay, you may think that's about Joseph. But if you look carefully, you will see that Joseph points to somebody much bigger, much greater, that at one point was sold, right? By whom? By one of his brothers, the one that sat with him at the table, right? So typology is about a smaller reality, historical fact, pointing your attention to something much bigger. And that we will see in the story of Abraham. So I would need you to look at the first page on your worksheet. See how the covenant, the blessing, the promise, and the seed are pointed out in structures that are parallel. Covenant with Abraham in chapter 15, covenant with Abraham in chapter 17. And then, when you look at uh, the bigger structure, this one here, you can see that at the beginning you will have blessing for Abraham. At the end of the structure, the blessing given to Abraham is re-emphasized. There's even a Bible verse from chapter 12 that is repeated almost verbatim in chapter 24 about how God blesses Abraham. Then you have the blessing pronounced on both sides of the chiasm. You have the promise of the seed on both sides of the chiasm. And you have, of course, a lot of focus on the birth of Isaac, who is the one that carries on the covenant. But beyond structure, I would like us to go through this chronological reality of how the promise, the blessing, the covenant, the seed is brought into picture, and how that type, because yes, we are dealing here with typology, 
how that type points to a much bigger reality, to an anti-type. First, let's look at Abraham being called. Abraham is called in chapter 12. Now the Lord has said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Question. What of these four elements have you heard in this passage? You have blessing, obviously. Promise, you have promises there. Do you have the covenant? Uh-uh. Not yet, not yet. Do you have the seed? Yeah. Although the word itself does not appear, unless you have a translation that is not a literal translation, but when it says, I will make your name great, that's an indirect reference to the seed. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That's also an indirect reference to the seed. But we don't have it pointed out yet. Then Abraham arrives at Canaan. Chapter 12, verse 7. And this is the verse that is repeated in chapter 24. Verse 7. The same verse. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. What do you find in this verse out of these four elements? Uh huh. The seed, seed, and promise. It's a promise regarding the seed, right? Next step Lot separates from Abram, chapter 13. Because now we are going through the story of Abraham. It's a cross-section study of the story of Abraham. Lot separates from Abraham. Notice, please, that when this critical moment happens, God comes back to Abraham and renews the relationship. Genesis chapter 13, verses 14. And the Lord said to Abraham, after Lot had separated from him. This separation, it's a, a breaking point in Abraham's story. It's a painful experience. After that painful experience, God comes back to him and says, lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, westward, for all the land which you see I give to you and your descendants forever. Okay? And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. Arise, walk in the land, through its land and its width, for I give it to you. What of these four elements have you found there? Promise, obviously, and again, the seed. When it comes to promise, there are two components, and I will show it like this. There's a component that has to do with the seed. There's one more component in the promise, and you could see that in chapter 12 as well. Beyond the seed, beyond having descendants, what is the promise to Abraham, to Abram at this point? That he will get what? The land. The land. Yes, we usually focus on the seed. But part of the promise is also the land. Okay, so let's now also see how that evolves. Next chapter, chapter 14, 
is when Lot is in trouble. Abraham goes to rescue him. You remember the story. And when he comes back from uh, the battle, a priest of God the Most High called, what's his name? Melchizedek. The priest comes out. And what does he, he do? He blesses Abraham. You can look at uh, verse 19, which is practically the highest point of a little chiasm. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tithe, that is Abraham to Melchizedek. So, Melchizedek reiterates what? The blessing, right? That Abraham is blessed. Abraham is then, in chapter 15, afraid. We don't know exactly why he is afraid, but one hint is given by the text. When you obtain a big victory with your limited number of soldiers against some kings that took your nephew and his family hostage, you're successful. Then you go home, you start processing, and you think, oh my goodness, now, now what? Because I'm new here, I just moved to the area, these kings have been here in alliances for quite some time, what if now they will come and revenge? And he is afraid. How do I know he is afraid? Chapter 15, from the beginning. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. If somebody is not afraid, would you tell him or her, don't be afraid? I am your shield. Shield. And that's again important because what is a shield for? Defense where? Protection where? It's a defense, it's a shield when you go to army. It's like pointing back to, hey, I know, I know you went to army and now you, you feel like you're alone. Who's going to protect you in front of these people? And he says, hey, I am your shield. I protect you. Your exceedingly great reward. And this is amazing because if God is Abraham's great reward, what does Abraham need really? It's like telling him, Abram, you have everything in me. You have me. I am your reward. But Abraham said, Lord God, what will you give me seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Then Abraham said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward the heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? And uh, jump to verse 18. On the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river Euphrates. So this is a critical moment when he's afraid. God reiterates what? A promise. What exactly? Seed, 
plus land. And what else? What? The covenant. Yes, this is the first time the covenant appears. The word covenant in the text. So here God cuts the covenant, you know, the animals cut in the middle, and God enters into covenant officially with Abram. Okay? So the seed appears here, obviously. You can see clearly that something is being built. We are going somewhere with this whole description. Next chapter, 16, is when Hagar has to run away because she can't take it any longer. God promises something to Hagar regarding Ishmael. Chapter 16, verses 7 to 12. Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of waters in the wilderness, by the spring of the way on the way to Shur. And he said, that is the angel, Hagar, Sarai's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit herself under her hand. And the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly so that they shall not be counted for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, behold, you are with child and you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael because the Lord has heard your affliction. He shall be a wild man. His hand shall be against every man and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. What do we have here? We have promise. But this is outside of the typology. It's a promise that God will take care of Ishmael as well. But it's not within this typological thing going on here. Here, something is being built. There is a seed here that is like the dust. It's like the stars. And at one point, it's like the sand. Then we continue chapter 17. In chapter 17, the name changes. Abram becomes Abraham. The sign of the covenant is given. What is the sign of the covenant? Circumcision, correct. Sarai becomes Sarah. She is blessed. She receives the promise as well. The covenant promise is applied to Isaac, starting with verse 19. Then God said, No, Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall beget twelve princes and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this set time next year. The right translation there is at the appointed time next year. So who is the seed then? Who's the seed based on this? You're right. Isaac. And we know Ishmael, although he is blessed by God, is not the seed. But then I'm asking you, is Isaac the seed? Yes or no? Let's see. Let's go, go on. Before Sodom is destroyed, in chapter 18, the promise is reconfirmed. Genesis 18, verse 14. 
Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Who's this son? Isaac. Verse 18, since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. In Abraham, through whom? Who's the seed? Isaac. Good. Let's go on. The question is the same. Is Isaac the seed? He's one of the seeds. So is Ishmael, if you want. He's a seed as well. But who is the seed? Before Ishmael leaves, in chapter 21, you know, now Ishmael is born, then Isaac is born, then Ishmael makes fun of Isaac, Sarah becomes mad, she wants him out, he leaves, and let's look at Genesis 21, verses 12 and 13. But God said to Abraham, do not let it be displeasing in your sight because of the lad or because of your bondwoman. Whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice, for in Isaac your seed shall be called. So is Isaac the seed? If in Isaac Abraham's seed will be called. Yet I will also make a nation of the son of the bondwoman because he is your seed. So who's the seed? Because the other guy is a seed as well. Both of them are biologically seeds, right? Both Isaac and Ishmael. But your seed, says God, will be called in whom? Again, Isaac. Mm -hmm. Typology. Let's go one step further. After Isaac's sacrifice, after Isaac is sacrificed, well, actually, he is not sacrificed. He's almost sacrificed if you look from the outside. But if you look from the inside, God says Abraham in his inner being did it. It, it was considered by God as if he had done it. So look at chapter 22 from verse 15. It says, Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven. And this is right after the sacrifice, which is uncompleted from our perspective, from the outside. And said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son your only son. Your only son? He has one son, Abraham? Oh, he has two sons. But who's the only son then? So there's a certain way in which Isaac is the only son. Yes, Ishmael is a biological son as well. But there's a certain way in which Isaac is the only son. Do you know somebody else that is the only son? See how typology is built? When you follow the language of the story, at one point you are having this revelation and say, oh, 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 this is more than Isaac. There's something much bigger in view here. So go back to the text. Genesis 22, verse 17. And have not withheld your son, your only son. Blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven. See? Thus the stars send. And as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. Again, this is very interesting language. Your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. Possessing the gates of the enemies means you are 
in charge there. It's that picture from the movies when the king stands in front of the gates of the city behind him. The gates of the enemies. Because you have obeyed my voice. And this is where the typology story seems to end. Only that, you will see next time, in chapter 23, Sarah dies, Abraham buries her, and then we have a story about Abraham, the father, sending somebody to find a bride for his son. The father sends somebody to bring a bride to his son. Does that ring a bell? Who sends whom? God the Father sends somebody to get the church for his son. But we'll see that next time. Now we are focusing on the seed. Galatians 3.16 clarifies who the seed is. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say and to seeds as of many, but as of one and to your seed who is Christ. We got it? So we know who the seed is. My question is this. What is going on with the land? If you think about what Abraham is doing, God tells him, go there because I am going to give you the land. He gets there. His nephew separates from him. And he tells his nephew, you know what? If you go that way, I'm going this way. Whatever you want, take. Yeah, Abraham, but God said he was going to give it to you. No worries. Whatever you need, just take it. Then you see his interaction with King Abimelech. King Abimelech at one point is afraid of Abraham. Because he sees Abraham's ascension there. He's becoming a strong guy. God is with him, obviously. So Abimelech wants a non-aggression or kindness covenant with Abraham. And Abraham says, of course, I'm going to sign. No problem. As if he doesn't care about the land. Not only that, when Sarah dies and he needs a burial place, Instead of going and taking a place of burial which is even offered to him, what does he say? No, I'm going to buy a piece of land for burial place. Why? There's an answer to that. In Genesis chapter 15, verses 13 to 16, God tells Abraham specifically that 400 years have to pass before his descendants will be able to inherit the land, the land of Canaan. Uh-huh. So Abraham knew, because in chapter 15, right in the chapter where the covenant first appears, right here, God tells him, yes, but it will take 400 years. Where is Abraham after 400 years? In the dust. Did he get the land? Look at Acts chapter 7 verse 5. In Acts chapter 7 verse 5. Stephen. You know the story of Stephen. Stephen the first martyr. It says. And God gave him no inheritance in it. Not even enough to set his foot on. And he's talking about Abraham. But even when Abraham had no child, he promised to give it to him for a possession and to his descendants after him. 
So how much did Abraham really inherit from the land God promised? Nothing. Not even enough to set his foot on. That's the text. So what's going on with Abraham? Hebrews chapter 11 from verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country. So he dwelt there as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. So what is the promise he was waiting for? The city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So where is this going? Now you're lost. Well, the land, actually, the promised land is still in the future. The promised land of the seed and you in the seed is still in the future. By faith, Abraham saw it. By faith, Sarah was going in that direction. But, you know, we all want to get to heaven. That's the specific evangelical way of saying it, when in fact, biblically, we are going back to the promised land, to the new earth, right? And that is still in the future. So this is how typology, from a story, from a historical reality that happens somewhere, points to a much bigger reality, Jesus Christ, you in Jesus Christ, becoming the seed in Jesus Christ, and the land, you by faith already have it, but still you are a stranger and a pilgrim on this earth because this is not the land. The land is the promised land in the future. Questions? Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's true. So what you get out of this is, yes, yeah, you are part of the seed in Jesus Christ, and the promised land is for you. And you are still a stranger and a pilgrim walking toward that city made and built by God himself, which is the city of New Jerusalem, according to the book of Revelation, right? Yes. Very good question. What happens to the Jewish people if the seed is us in Jesus Christ, if the land is still in the future, so then what is going on with regard to the Jewish people? Well, simple. Typology is a historical reality. The type is created by the Jewish people. But even in the Jewish people, it is within the Jewish people that somebody carries on the seed. Because, yes, we usually say the Jews, the Jewish people. But Jesus Christ biologically came from only one stem 
one tribe of the Jewish people. Which one? The tribe of Judah. So you always have somebody that carries on the type until type meets the anti-type. You have, you have uh, somebody carrying on the seed. You have Isaac. You have Jacob. You have Judah. And if you go to the genealogy in Matthew or to the genealogy in Luke, you will see that uh, there is a biological descendant how the seed, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, is brought in. And uh, at one point, the type meets the anti-type. And it is fulfilled. That's the word. It is fulfilled. In Jesus Christ, this whole story of the blessing, of the promise, of the covenant, of the seed is fulfilled. Only that, only that, the land is still in the future. Only by faith. Just like Abraham, just like Sarah, only by faith. The language of the Apostle Paul is actually, we have been seated with Jesus Christ in heavenly places. But that's a faith reality at this point. And this is what theologically is called already but not yet. Yes, we are already citizens of uh, the heavenly places, citizens of New Jerusalem, but not yet. And, and in this tension between faith and reality, our existence is consumed. Back to your question, how about the Jews? Just like we become the seed in Jesus Christ, any Jew can be the seed in Jesus Christ. So, you and the Jew in Jesus Christ can be the seed. And that's one of the points of uh, the Apostle Paul, because he always has in his letters, in Romans, for instance, in Colossians, in Ephesians, he always tries to point out to the Jews, to his people, to his own folks, hey, yes, we have been part of this typology reality. Yes, we are the genealogy through us. Well, at least one tribe from among us, the Messiah came in. But that in itself doesn't take us anywhere. It doesn't take us to the promised land. In order for us to go to the promised land, we all have to be in Christ. And that is the seed. So if somebody wants the promised land, the only way to go to the promised land is the seed. Now, there is in evangelical dispensational theology this idea that at one point in time in the future, the Jewish nation as a block will come back and they will all recognize Jesus Christ as a nation. They will say, yes, Christ is the Messiah, and they will accept Jesus Christ as the seed in which they can become the seed. Problem with that thought is that it generalizes. I strongly believe there will be a time where more and more Jews will recognize Jesus Christ as being actually the Messiah. I would risk saying that there is a time already because in Israel, in America, within the Jewish community, there is a strong movement of Messianic Jews. You know about that. I think the danger is when we overgeneralize it and we act as if they, in a block, as a nation, will accept Jesus Christ. And that is hard to sustain biblically. But I think there is potent biblical evidence that there will be a turning back to Jesus Christ even within the Jewish community. But the same can be said about the world by and large in a certain way, because biblically we are looking to a time where the gospel is preached to every nation 
as, as what? Let me read the verse because uh, I think it's, it's important in this context. Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a, what? Witness. As a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. What is interesting in this passage is that it doesn't say who exactly will be preaching this gospel. The way it's put here suggests that behind this final preaching of the gospel to every nation, it is God himself. I believe there is evidence in the Bible that toward the end of history, I think in a near future, there will be a special outpouring of the Holy Spirit where the gospel will be preached at a level and of an efficiency or effectiveness comparable to what happened at the day of Pentecost in the beginning. For that, yes, I think there is biblical evidence. Within that reality, I believe the messianic movement among the Jews will get stronger and stronger as well. Yes, very good observation. You know, when Jesus had the conversation with the solid Jewish scribe or scholar, philosopher, Nicodemus, he told him, you have to be born again. It's like, what? I? I have to be born again? But I've been a good guy. I've been doing this and that. You hearing Paul say the same thing later on, and he says, yeah, Jews or non-Jews, it is the gospel that saves. Because that's the power of God for the salvation of the Jew first. Obviously, historically, the Jew has a um, historical advantage to it because that's where it all starts, because they are the type reality. Or within the Jewish nation, you can see the type corridor leading up to the antitype, Jesus Christ. But having the Messiah come from among us does not necessarily save us. You have to be born again. Genesis chapter 16, verse 12. This is about Ishmael. He shall be a wild man. His hand shall be against every man. And every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. What's interesting about him, that 12 kings come from him just like 12 tribes come from Jacob. So the question is then, what is going on with this prophecy here? Because here says, um, verse 7, the angel of the Lord is speaking to Hagar. Hagar being the mother of Ishmael, the servant that was given by Sarah to Abraham to solve the problem as a complimentary wife. I know you know that concept by now. So what's going on with Ishmael? How does this prophecy really reflect the reality, the future reality of Ishmael? Well, if you analyze a little bit the story of the descendants of Ishmael, this is true in their case. Now, the big question is, is this a prophecy in the sense that God predicts it and shapes this reality so that it will happen in the future? Or God predicts it in the sense of because he knows in advance what will happen, he can reveal in advance what will happen. So one is actively shaping his story and 
this history of Ishmael evolving out of the divine will shaping their history, or it's happening in the future because of human decisions, and history is a conglomerate of human decisions on smaller or higher levels, and all that together create a very complicated and intricate historical reality, which God in his foreknowledge or all foreknowledge knows in advance, therefore he can predict it. I believe, based on the Bible, prophetic insights are revealed not necessarily based on divine acting power, but also, or rather, and I would debate whether it's one or the other, also or rather based on divine foreknowledge or all foreknowledge. It's one thing looking at my child to tell you this child will end up this way or the other way just based on what I can see in my child. And it's slightly or radically different to look at my child and tell you this is what will happen to him because I will make him do that. It can be both. The question is, in Ishmael's case, can you blame God for the wildness and the animosity that is part of the prophetic insight with regard to him? Or it's rather based on their personal decisions. I hope it helps. That's a good question. Is this wildness or this against everybody that is in the text, his hand shall be against every man and every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Is this fighting for the promise? Is this an attempt on Ishmael's side overall to get the promise this here? The blessing, the promise, the covenant, the seed typology to, to take it and uh, make it a divine possession, it can be inferred to some degree, especially if you look at uh, the fights and struggles with regard to the possession of the land, of the holy land today. But again, it's hard to say how much of that is just normal evolvement of historical decisions and forces and human powers, and how much of that is part of this prophetic prediction that God knew in advance. But I would not eliminate totally that element. We don't know too much about Ishmael's history. So the question is, what happened to Ishmael from that point on? What we know at that point where Ishmael appears in the story is that God constantly shows care, kindness, and uh, benevolence toward Ishmael as well. Yes, God says he's not, he's not the seed that carries on the type toward the antitype, the seed, Jesus Christ, the seed. But he will be blessed. He will do this. He will do that. God also says, hey, he will be wild. And uh, his hand will be against everybody. And everybody's hand will be against him. So somewhere in history, I think this historical insight starts becoming visible in the life of Ishmael. I'm not an expert of uh, what happened to him, but what I can see from history to this day 
is the animosity happening? Now, are there people from Ishmael that are part of the seed today? Of course. Ishmael has the same possibility, I mean, the descendants of Ishmael, they're the descendants of Isaac, and any other descendant of any other stem or tribe has to become seed in Jesus Christ. And I think this is the beauty of the gospel, that even if historically not everybody plays the same role in the divine fulfillment of God's plans, when it comes to salvation, everybody is on equal position, even those that we may suspect based on some historical realities as being favored or unfavored by God. In Isaac's case, we would suspect God of uh, favoritism. And in Ishmael's case, we may suspect God of unfavoritism. But our time is up. Thank you so much for your deep going questions. Lord, we thank you so much. And we pray that you will continue to deepen our understanding in Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. Amen.